Okay, so when I wrote this title about uh, narrowing down the early domestication history of the watermelon with ancient seeds and DNA, I couldn't have known how true it would be, and you will see at the very end. Okay, so <laughs> the watermelon is an easily identified plant. All of us know a watermelon when we see one. And you would think that, and it's also a small genus with six or seven uh, species, all of them in Africa. You would think we would have figured out at least the progenitor, probable progenitor and time of, of domestication by now, but you will see we actually know very little. Okay, so the type of the name Momordica lanata uh, is shown here. And it was collected by a student of Linnaeus Thunberg, shown here, who spent over a year uh, traveling and collecting in South Africa. And he had also left a diary where he precisely describes how he uh, interacted with farmers who were growing domesticated watermelon. And he also found a wild watermelon, Momordica lanatus. At the time, the species was in the genus Momordica, and he named it Momordica lanata because of its len, uh, woolly young fruits. And you can see this very well. And of course, he knew his teacher's domesticated watermelon, Momordica vulgaris. Okay? He knew this was different in his opinion. Unfortunately, in the 30s, the two names were uh, synonymized. Linnaeus's domesticated plants, based on specimens from Italy, and this stuff collected by his students, those names were synonymized in the 30s, which created the idea that watermelon might originate in South Africa. The plant is also indeed domesticated. This species is also domesticated. If you boil the rind in sugar long enough, you get a wonderful jam, a photo by one of my students here. And this is also used still today in baking powder um, in the United States. Okay, another species from West Africa is this one. Um, it's domesticated for its juicy, not juicy, tasty, oily seeds, which are used in many local dishes there. The seeds are ground up and they're the main component in these stews. Another species is this one from North Africa, also famous. This one is used, it's extremely bitter and it's used as a diuretic and maybe also for abortion medicine. I, I'm not quite sure about it. It's extremely bitter, it's the colocent. It extends its range to India probably more recently. Then there's another one from the Namib Desert. This one, for obvious reasons, lacks tendrils. Of the <laughs> thousand cucurbitaceae, only two that I know of lack tendrils. One is a tree in Socotra, and one is this one. There's nothing to climb on, no tendrils. And there's another one from the Namib Desert, discovered or described only in, the 19, in 1990. And here is another one. Um, unusual, it originally placed in a different genus, but DNA clearly says it's a, it belongs in the genus Citrullus. Now you have all the watermelons shown here, the species of the, in the genus Citrullus. Okay, the ones that I just showed you. And you will notice that they're, uh, well, you can believe me, their pulp is extremely bitter, 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 bitter. Well, you can boil the rind and sugar and eat that. Bitter, bitter, occasionally mild, the seeds used in the stews. And there's one form named by Schweinfurt, whom I will show in two slides on, which has, that has sweet pulp. The pulp in all these is white or whitish. Okay. The oldest seeds of the genus Citrullus are from a famous site in Libya, Wang Muhuja. Uh, you see the site marked by a star there, and you see two of the seeds there. And the seeds of the genus Citrullus really are different. Within Cucurbitaceae, you're different from Cucumis seeds. Cucumis, cucumber, and melon, also often cultivated, of course, and si some of these seeds are found at the same sites, but the seeds can be distinguished by this flare that I think you see there. The site is famous because there is um, a mummy was found there, the, the black mummy. If you Google black mummy, you come immediately to more information about it. These people who, who lived at this site, they knew the mummification techniques, wonderful, perfectly mummified, human bodies a thousand years before the Egyptians. There's no doubt about it. There's lots of research on this black mummy. The site is also 
well documented from C14 dating. For example, this basket or fragments of a basket, C14 dated to 8,790 uh, before present. This is the site where we have the oldest Citrullus seeds. So now, where was Citrullus domesticated? Let's put this data I have given you so far on the map. We have, I don't have a pointer, or maybe I do. Sorry, the oldest seeds from Libya, basically. This thing domesticated for its seeds or used for its seeds. And uh, the earliest uh, genome sequencing of Citrullus, which came out in Nature in 2013, actually placed this thing as very close to the domesticated watermelon. But their species sampling was completely incomplete. They only had domesticated and this West African thing, so OK. So this was the, then we have Thunberg. There is no fossils and no archaeological evidence for any domestication earlier than seven, 16th century. And then we have Schweinfurt, who collected, as I said, this, these sweet watermelons in the 1870s here in the Sudan. And he held these to be the progenitor of domesticated watermelon. They are small. The diameter is about 8 centimeters. I have them in cultivation. And then there is uh, Schweinfurt again, who helped Maspero and others identify fragments of plants found in Egyptian coffins as these were excavated, sarcophagi, as these were excavated, uh, uh, excavated or dug up. And Schweinfurt identified leaf fragments not from this coffin, not this particular one, but another one from the same site as belonging to Citrullus. And he sent this leaf after having studied these hairs on the surface. He actually, he um, placed the leaf, and he describes this all in his nature paper on this leaf and other fragments. He placed it in water. He extended it. It's quite large. He looked at it from above and from below and said, this is watermelon, and sent it to his friend Hooker at Q, where here's the document from the archives. Here's the leaf and uh, Mark Nesbitt, who is maybe here, uh, took it out for me and sent me a little, tiny fragment for sequencing. And the DNA turned out to be wonderful. So here's a collaborator, or my technician, in the ancient DNA lab in Berlin of Michael Hofreiter in Berlin just before working on this. And here is a picture of Oscar Perez, who I think is in the audience, or I hope is in the Ah, here he is, <laughs> who did the bioinformatics on these data. OK, and the DNA turned out to be wonderful, despite all this water, you know, all these, what Schweinfurt did with it to identify it. Without Schweinfurt, we wouldn't have had this leaf sent to Q any in the first place. And here is a mapping of the ancient DNA. The plant has 11 chromosomes. Here you see the ancient DNA. Here you see the domesticated uh, Citrullus DNA from that Chinese paper I just mentioned. And cucumber as an outgroup, it has only seven chromosomes. And we were extremely lucky. I will be very short about this, OK, the technical part. We were extremely lucky in that two traits that have clearly have to do with the domestication, namely the red pulp which is in none of the wild ones, and the loss of bitterness, which obviously is a precondition for human feeding or eating watermelon, were, are well studied in this gene. So genes related to these traits are known. So we could look for mutations in these genes. And I would just show you a very a cartoon almost. So on chromosome 1 is basically what I've called loss of good bitterness, which is due to this premature stop colon in this particular gene having to do with bitterness. <laughs> there are other genes that have to do with loss of bitterness and cucurbits. And this one is a key gene known. And here we have the domesticated modern watermelon, the pharao, I will call it pharao watermelon, and the other outgroups, all of which I showed you pictures of. And here we must have a mild form. This is the one used in the West African stews. And the particular individual that was used, the phenotype is known because I emailed the guy who collected this material. And he actually did taste the pulp in his, for his dissertation. He's West African, Akian Dako is his name. He did confirm that this particular individual was, in fact, a mild one. The pulp tasted mild, not sweet, but mild. OK, and then on chromosome 4, there's the red color, which one of the genes responsible for red color, here again, domesticated, pharao, and all the others, including this West African thing. And only the pharao DNA and the domesticated one show this 
valine instead of a phenyl phenylalanine, which we know causes red color. Okay, so we were just extremely lucky to have these two traits and to find them and to really show the unique mutations shared between the furrow DNA and modern DNA. So here you have a phylogeny, complete phylogeny of the genus Citrullus, and here you have the West African one. Here you have the loss of bitterness, which is not, it is, it's um, polymorphic here in this one, okay? Here it's not polymorphic. They are all edible, extremely sweet. The sugar content is known from this. And here's the furrow DNA, and here's the geographic location of this. So we can really see first the loss of bitterness, and then the red pulp. People like the red color. <laughs> okay, so clearly the Egyptians, <laughs> Egyptians ate red sweet watermelon. They were so far advanced, they inspired, they had it all. I mean, look at what she's wearing. Okay? <laughs> okay, I put this skirt on extra for her. All right. So, so do we now know who domesticated the watermelon? And I'm very skeptic about it. Okay? So yes, the Egyptians, I think this is watermelon. Okay? It's a fruit served cold on a tray. This is watermelon. Right? I they, of course, it fits. The archaeological evidence, or in this case, the paintings, the tomb uh, paintings, fits with what we know from the genes. Okay? But there is this, the oldest seed is from Libya. Okay? And the sweet plants are from the Sudan, Nubian farmers. I, would, I just say Nubian farmers, but I mean, what I have here is from Darfur. Okay? We know from archaeological evidence that the Sara was green 8,000 years ago, and that large animals grazing on it. All that stuff is documented. We know that about 7,000 years ago there was a drastic change in the vegetation of the Sahara. Here are these uh, drawings, these are 7,000 years old. The animals people were hunting and there are lots of papers indicating uh, that possibly overgrazing contributed to the very rapid change. It must also have been a contribution from climate change, but overgrazing must have or su suspected to contribute to the massive change in vegetation in the Sahara. So we know all this. And, sorry? No, I need to go back. Here. A paper came out in end of July 2019. It's an amazing paper in science. This is 70 complete genomes of East African and West African people. So here we have East Africa, this orange, East Africa. Here we have West Africa, and the green is Sudanese people. Each one is a dated skeleton, okay, with a complete genome, 70 genomes. Now the sampling in West Africa is only this one person, and lots of the sampling is very uneven. But clearly the, these crossings here, crosses, these bars indicate admixture. But what is most interesting is this thing here, the clusters of black dots here. Genetic clustering despite um, culture, despite cultural variation. So we must remember, these are humans. People learn from each other. We all have, let's say, you know, we all have the same iPhone. We don't need to mate to have the same iPhone. <laughs> people learn from each other. So whenever it comes to people and domestication, we have to be very careful. And what they conclude in this wonderful paper, I really have to put my glasses on here, to read this quote, it's at the end of this paper. Models formulated on the basis of ancient DNA are a starting point for further, further exploration through additional archaeological, linguistic, and genetic research. And I think this is so true. We must not be carried away but with ancient DNA studies, particularly if the sampling is so poor. And so I was so happy this morning. As I was sitting there, I got this email from the same lab in Berlin, and the seed extract, the DNA of ancient seeds has is great, we just need, it needs to be analyzed still. <laughs> so we have DNA from the oldest seed, one of these oldest seeds. Let me go one back, I have the time. Okay, here, one of these seeds. These are the seeds from Juan Mahujak, okay? And one of them I sent to Berlin, of course with permission of the archeologists who dug them up. Okay, and so we have now DNA of the seed from Libya, and we also have DNA from a seed from Amara, where Philippa Ryan, who is here in the audience, she works at Kew, has a, is doing archaeobotanical work, 
And these two seeds, I think, will greatly add, the analysis of the DNA once it's done, <laughs> will greatly add to the sampling density and the understanding, of, and also, of course, the temporal depth, to the understanding of when red pulp and loss of bitterness and possibly other traits uh, originated where and when they originated. Thank you. <laughs>